Welcome everyone to the Sustainable Finance Initiative Seminar. I am so excited for this one. Uh, I'm, it is my great pleasure to introduce XJ Jan, who is a, a well, recent MSX graduate, uh, who I had the pleasure of having in my class and who we were fortunate enough to um, be able to work with, who reached out with an interest in the research that we've been doing at SFI and its application, uh, particularly in the automotive sector. Um, and so before I turn it over to XJ and his presentation, I just want to do a little table setting, uh, which XJ asked me to do, uh, to put this work in context. So um, this goes back, the con we'll start with the, with the diagnostics that the Sustainable Finance Initiative, uh, our research team did uh, in the lead up to the COP in Glasgow, we published a book called Settling Climate Accounts, Navigating the Road to Net Zero, which looked at the rise of net zero as the dominant organizing principle of climate action and all of the various tools and data sources and frameworks that were being used to, to set targets and implement uh, activities in pursuit of those targets and considered the ways in which practitioners were going to struggle to make net zero add up. And we identified at the conclusion of the book, I'll save you some time, four unsettled accounts that were going to continue to plague practitioners as they tried in earnest to make net zero add up. And I'll go through them briefly because they have implications for this work and help you to understand the problems we're trying to solve here. So the first is this uh, issue of data, which is to say that there's a lot of noise in the data and there's a lot of opportunity for greenwashing. In the context of this conversation, that data is around emissions inventories and counting carbon. The next unsettled account we identified we call boundaries, which is best embodied in the uh, questions and hand-wringing that, that comes up to anyone who's stared into the abyss of scope three, which is these questions of um, where to draw the boundaries, how to manage um, capital through uh, flexible boundaries um, and confusing boundaries. And so this is an issue we identified that was going to continue to, to be a challenge for practitioners. The second two, the last two were what we called timing and obligations. And timing is best embodied in the questions and challenges around carbon offsets, in particular, think of uh, forestry projects, um, where you've got the, the, the reality that, that climate is a stock problem, right? These emissions persist in the atmosphere for hundreds or thousands of years. Net zero is a flow concept. Uh, we are selling offsets, tearing up those certificates and not attending to the stock issues. And so we've got this kind of mismatch of timing or a forest burns and there's no uh, accounting or accountability for new emissions or the, the absence of that, um, of that certificate and the underlying asset it was allegedly pointing to. And finally, we have this question of obligations, which is to say, even if you solve the data boundary and timing problems, what are you supposed to do with this information? We have a moral obligation, we have a scientific obligation, but the financial obligation and and fiduciary obligation is, is much murkier in terms of how to make trade-offs in uncertainty over time. Uh, and so if the book was a giant diagnostic of all the ways in which net zero is going to struggle to add up, the work that we've been doing recently on carbon accounting and accountability is the solution set. And they attend, together they attend to these four unsettled accounts. And just briefly as a primer, because again, XJ is going to cover this in a particular application through a case study, which or I say, whenever we talk about this work, the first question we get is, well, can you give me an example? And that's what we're doing today is giving you an example, which I'm really excited about. But just quickly, this idea of carbon accounting is, is, that, is the foundational methodology that thus far has been missing in practice to ac account for emissions as they move through complex and geographically dispersed supply chains. And the, and the tool that has been missing in, in pursuit of that goal is, is accounting based on principles that are centuries old and that can be applied in this context of, of emissions uh, using the practices essentially of inventory accounting or cost accounting. And that methodology is called e-liability accounting. It was developed by faculty at Harvard and Oxford. There is now an e-liability institute that has enabled dozens of companies across many sectors and many regions of the world to pilot e-liability accounting through their supply chains. And, and the Institute is also now working on developing guidance uh, to, to, um, to make this a, a standard accounting practice. 
that's sort of step one of, of the two big ideas that we're going to talk about is, is this just this shift from counting carbon to accounting for carbon. The second shift is, is gets to this accountability question, which is to say, once you have a, a true and fair representation of emissions, recognizing those as long duration liabilities, what are the assets that can defease those liabilities on a duration matched basis? And how does the concept of a carbon balance sheet or carbon solvency over a particular duration, uh, how does that affect and, and solve the many challenges we're facing in terms of scaling up investment in decarbonization, in terms of reconciling carbon markets, in terms of making transition finance a, a rational capital allocation decision-making exercise? And so these, these concepts or, or these, um, these research areas of carbon accounting and accountability um, have opened up a, a suite of activities for businesses and investors to actually make net zero, uh, make auditable net zero claims. And so again, the question we get is, well, what does this look like in practice? How would a company actually go about using e-liabilities uh, to account for their emissions? And what would it mean for a company to be carbon solvent using emissions liability management? What would it cost? And, and how, does, how do these tools compare to the existing tools? What problems are we solving? And what problems are we potentially inviting? And so with that table setting, I'm thrilled to turn it over to XJ, who's going to walk us through a case study of these tools in the automotive sector. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for Dali. And thank you, Alicia, for the really helpful uh, macro picture of the evolution of carbon accounting and why a better framework is much needed. So the purpose of this presentation is really to provide a micro view of the bigger picture uh, and trying to understand the application in the automotive se sector and specifically using the tire company Pirelli as an example to understand what is really missing in the current system and what are the benefits ELM or e-liability can bring. My name is XJ. Uh, thank you everyone for dialing in and I would like to say that the evolution Alicia talked about it it's still ongoing so the work we're presenting is not finished and I'm absolutely all ears for any opinions suggestions about this case study and you can write me email afterwards um, so the paper is already published in SFI so if you uh, have time take a look and see if uh, you disagree or agree with any part of it and we can discuss afterwards. Today's presentation will have uh, four sections. Uh, the first part is kind of an overview of where we are right now, how the current uh, automotive industry is addressing its green transition as well as its uh, emission disclosure. Second and third part is the application and discussion of e-liability on the case study of Pirelli. And finally, we want to have a call to actions and how practitioners can be part of this, uh, uh, this, this journey. So looking at the automotive sector or the transport sector, it's really one of the most pivotal sector in all the decarbonization discussions we have. Uh, it's, the emission has risen uh, rapidly from 5 gigaton CO2 in 1990s to uh, 8 gigaton in 2022, and the sector's GHG emission will account for around one-fourth of uh, of the world's total, and out of it, 70% uh, uh, is from the road transport uh, uh, subsector, the cars, vans, buses, trucks. So the automotive sector is really a pivotal, important sector for the global decarbonization, which I think it's consensual and widely known. And the decarbonization strategies or focus so far, we have seen uh, both from the government uh, perspective, as well as from the OEM perspective, seem to be focusing on one single KPI, which is the EV sales. So be it 2021 Glasgow uh, zero emission declaration or the uh, EV sales target of all these top global OEMs, it's really the EV sales ratio that everyone is focusing on. As a Tesla driver, I personally wish that's the answer meaning that if we change the new car sales to 100% BAFs and the car fleet getting close to 100% BAFs in 10, 15 years after that uh, uh, ICE ban, the carbon emission of the whole uh, transport sector will be solved. However, from this study, you will see that that's, that's not the whole picture. That's not the complete story. Switching gears to talk about the uh, trends in the uh, 
a scope three measurement, the reason why we think it's important is automotive sector stands out have uh, been the sector that scope three matters the most, meaning that the consumer face, the use of the uh, the use phase of the product uh, generates the highest uh, portion of GHG throughout the life cycle of the company or the product. And there are several emerging trends we see here uh, in Europe, US, and uh, like globally, that's really promotes the measurement and management of scope three emissions. So the Europe uh, uh, ESRS under CSRD mandates company to report scope three emissions. And in the US, the SEC, uh, although SEC doesn't regulate the scope three, however, the California regulation are setting targets for companies to report their scope three emissions in the, in the coming several years. And a very more important uh, tool or initiative we're seeing that impacts companies globally is the SBTI initiative and GHG protocol, which we will look into how companies are implementing them and what are the issues with it. And given the SBTI becoming the really the most popular and most important framework for companies to set in target and for the public to scrutinize the governance of a carbon management of these companies. The OEM as are really um, following the framework to set their targets, both for scope one and two, as you can see on the left-hand side of the picture, and also on their uh, scope three downstream, the scope three uh, category 11 CO2 uh, re 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 reduction uh, uh, towards 2035. So it seems that the issue we're talking about is already solved. Uh, the SBTI covers scope three. Uh, and if we translate, if we translate the whole fleet towards 100% EV sales, the whole emission problem of the sector is solved. But here we see a very important oversight of the whole thought process. That is, first of all, there's a oversight uh, or, or underestimation of the embodied emissions. So here is the study uh, as research, which is uh, from uh, Kearney which based its study on Polestar's and Rivian's data point. The reason why I like this study versus many others is that it's OEM specific. It's not a generic global industry average, but it's really built on specific OEM models. So the takeaway from this study is that first of all, uh, the transition towards from IC to BAF, it's not really like 100% solving the problem. The part of the reason is that, as you can see, the red part of the bar is the embodied emissions, in, including the uh, battery, uh, battery manufacturing, the vehicle manufacturing here, and the light red bar of it is the electricity that the BAFs, uh, uh, the, the electricity uh, pr production that the BAFs will consume as well as the fuel production uh, process, which is the uh, gasoline used by the ice. And uh, uh, so the takeaway from this study is that first of all, by transitioning to BAFs, we're actually having higher embodied emissions because of the battery manufacturing. Secondly, the grid mix become really critical for the BAFs in um, determining their carbon emission. So. The con con conclusion of the study is that by transitioning into 100%, uh, by transitioning towards 100% BEF in the uh, uh, global car fleet, it solves only one third of the problem of the sector. And the other th one third is the transition of the grid. And the remaining one third is the embodied emission, meaning the manufacturing process as well as the supply chain, which we think uh, we will have more insights in the later part of the presentation. So how is the SBTI governing this whole problem we're talking about? Alicia and S, uh, Stanford SFI study have provided multiple research, uh, really highlighting the multiple issues of the framework on a very high level, the inaccuracy of the emission counts, the uncertainty in the emission estimates, as well as there's limited transparency in the scope three emission reporting. And here's the quotes from Tesla's uh, impact re reporting 2023 that the scope three emission calculations are still really highly academic. Those frameworks, even though they're really widely used like GHG protocol, they still rely lar on large uh, estimations and assumptions that often lead to figures that are not really reflecting the true impact. All right, now it's time to really dive into the
a micro example of the bigger picture issues uh, in the tire company Pirelli. I want to emphasize that the reason why we chose Pirelli is not because Pirelli is not really doing all the work needed to decarbonize, but instead because it is a role model for its net zero commitment. It's being it's consistently being recognized by S, by CDP as the global a climate change leader, and it's really following the SBTI approved targets and SBTI framework. So what we can find as issues from the SBTI leaders are really, I think, something to highlight uh, as the issues of the whole framework. Pirelli, uh, for those who are not familiar with the company, it's a premium uh, consumer tire company. It's a market leader with around 50% share in the premium car brands like Ferrari, Lamborghini, Porsche, etc. It has a it has a capacity of 74 million tires per year, and it has over six billion euro revenue per year. And if we look into the distribution of its annual emissions of around 40 million tons of CO2, we can see that from the left uh, chart, uh, left figure, over 90% of its emissions are in its scope three consumer phase, meaning the indirect uh, uh, emissions from consumers who drive cars with Pirelli tires. And if we exclude this part of emissions, moving on to the right part, uh, right right uh, pie, pie chart, we can see that uh, uh, over 70% of the remaining emissions are from raw materials. Yeah. Uh, Pirelli has set its corporate goal of carbon neutrality, uh, although there's no definition of that term <laughs> anywhere uh, for its scope one and two by 2030. And it has uh, set its SBTI validated targets of 42% reduction in scope one and two uh, by 2025 relative to 2015 and a 9% reduction in scope three from purchased goods and services relative to uh, 2018. These are the targets that we will really uh, look into in details. Pirelli has really walked the talk. If we look into the track record of its GHG emissions, it has driven down its scope one, two, and three, uh, scope three category one, or the purchased goods and services meaningfully in the past several years. Therefore, in order to meet its SBTI targets, it only need around uh, less than 1% annual reduction rate in the coming several years. So by complying with SBTI framework, delivering what is uh, uh, promised or targeted on their SBTI, does that mean that uh, Pirelli is really on track to um, achieve meaningful progress to be 1.5 degree aligned. Um, before, can, before making that con conclusion, we'd like to highlight several issues we find uh, in this whole process. The first issue is the downstream scope three issue, uh, which is uh, the uh, scope three downstream or the, the scope three consumer face emissions we, we uh, highlight here. So the definition or how Pirelli categorize this uh, emission is that this is an estimate of the vehicle use of phase emissions attributable to the rolling resistance of the tires put on by Pirelli in the market. Meaning that to get this number, Pirelli has to first understand its tires, its rolling resistance, the tire mass, the mileage of the tire. Of course, these are internal data points, but critically, it has to go beyond its own knowledge to estimate the vehicle efficiency of the cars that are using Pirelli and also understand the fuel characteristics, meaning the fuel and also the grade of the cars that are driving with the Pirelli tire. So um, this, this really highlights two issues. Firstly, uh, the indeterminate overcounting in downstream scope three, I think Alicia uh, talked about in the beginning part. Um, this is part of the OEM's downstream uh, emissions too. And these are potentially part of the emissions of some other auto parts company too. So by reporting and um, publishing scope stream downstream emissions, the whole sector doesn't add up. We cannot add the whole sector or the public company's scope stream emissions together to, to see the trend or the progress of the decarbonization. And secondly, it raises concerns about the reliability of this data point. So to come up with this number, as we talked about, it really has to ask Pirelli to undertake the complex and theoretical tasks of 
estimating the powertrain mix of the vehicles sold by Pirelli's OEM customers, and also gauging the vehicle's efficiencies, and then attribute part of that whole estimate of emissions partly to the tire's rolling resistance. So incorporating this highly theoretical complex guesstimate downstream scope three emissions with its actual uh, upstream or other uh, scope three emissions, it really undermines the overall data in credit, uh, data, data integrity of its um, GHG emissions. The second issue uh, is, uh, oh, so if we zoom in out from Pirelli to the overall automotive industry, we can see the problem really prevalent. Um, even for OEM customers, they have to really undertake really complex estimate processes to understand their downstream scope three emissions. This is an example provided by um, Ferrari that how they gauge their GH emissions in the downstream, it has to come up with life cycle distance uh, traveled first and then uh, uh, emission factors. Both are, of course, not company specific and then with shipped companies. So uh, in my research, I've shown how, um, how companies have the discretion to change the emission factors as they wish and also change the life cycle distance traveled in the case of BMW and also how different companies really set like two, three times different life cycle, uh, uh, life distance traveled assumptions in the whole formula making, it's really hard to make apple to apple comparison uh, of different OEMs in this one single category of emissions. So uh, prioritizing speculative downstream scope three emissions in the GHG reporting really models the governance and evaluation of the overall actual emission of the automotive companies. The second issue is in the upstream. Here uh, we uh, showed how Pirelli and its peer company Michelin reported how they come up with, with their scope three upstream emissions. They clearly stated that it's from a commercial software. For Pirelli case, it's called Eco Design. For uh, Michelin, it's called Eco Invent. So they're drawing from this commercial uh, secondary data point uh, to come up with their company specific data, so which is obviously not reflecting the company's true picture. Pirelli, uh, SPTI encourages these companies to use more primary data. So Pirelli is doing that. So Pirelli said that the percentage of emissions calculated using data obtained from suppliers or value chain partners is 2%. And Michelin said that they're making significant changes uh, in their historical reporting of uh, scope three emissions because they changed their uh, emission factors uh, backwards. Although it might be a better trend or may may maybe it's a better thing because Michelin are changing from more generic factors to more they think are more specific and moving closer to reflecting more Michelin um, own case. However, such like arbitrary change to uh, emission factors made it really hard to make historical or benchmarking the company versus its peers or really trusting the data to be reflecting the true picture of the actual emissions. Uh, the third issue we want to highlight in the framework is the incentives. There is clear biased incentives towards decarbonization efforts. There's bias towards scope one, two reduction versus scope three. Why is that? First, SBTI offers companies alternatives to quantitative scope three emission targets, such as engagement targets. Therefore, companies can meet the requirements through supplier or customer engagements rather than direct emission re reductions. Of course, uh, Pirelli is doing better than that. So it has a quantitative scope three uh, emissions. However, in this quantitative scope three uh, emission targets under SBTI, it has a lower pace, lower required pace versus scope one two. For scope one two, you need to have 4.2% annual reduction rate to be qualified, but for scope three is 2.5%. So in this case, as we can see, although the raw materials, as we discussed in one of the pie charts, accounted for over 70% of the total emissions of the company. The absolute emission, which is the bar here, 
and the uh, re reduction rate of emission uh, for Pirelli in the period of 2018 to 2025 shows that scope three is really, you know, showing up a lower magnitude or less of focus versus scope one and two. So what's 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 the outcome of the whole framework in the case of Pirelli that it has incentivized the company to really focus on scope two emission reductions in the past several years, driven by purchase of renewable electricity and renewable energy certificates globally. Although it's not a focus of this paper, the uh, energy attributes transactions, ETAs, initially uh, conceived to promote the development of the renewable energy projects have really come under scrutiny and debates, which uh, SFI, especially Mark, has written a lot of uh, paper and research on. Uh, I'd encourage you to take a look at those papers too. Uh, the uh, last issue we want to highlight of the SBTI targets in the case of Pirelli is lack of transparency in the validation process. SBTI has a menu which is public. Pirelli has its targets which are public. However, we found issues reconciling these two, um, two numbers. SBTI's minimal threshold of annual linear reduction rate for scope three is 2.5%. Uh, However, Pirelli's qualified targets for its scope three from purchased goods and services in this period is 1.3%. So we really don't have a, you know, a source of explanation why this target is qualified. Okay. So shifting gears, um, let's move on to really talk about why e-liability and ELM uh, solve the issue, why such a reverse, uh, revised uh, framework is necessary to really recenter uh, attaining audible absolute emission re reductions. Um, this is the, uh, like the overview of the e-liability. So it's, it's conceptualized by um, Robert uh, Kaplan from Harvard and Karthik uh, Romana from Oxford, as uh, Alicia talked about, and this is kind of how it visualizes how the uh, emissions are um, uh, accounted for in this T account of e liability. You accumulate e liability by purchase raw materials, manufacturing, etc., and then transfer the e liability towards customers, which leads to the change in this uh, e account. And we want to visualize this by um, providing the, uh, the, the, the uh, quantitative analysis in the case study of Pirelli. We want to highlight that we want to call this company Pirelli Performa or PPF because uh, we have to incorporate the, quite a number of different sources of data point other than only from Pirelli because of the limitation of the data points we have in their internal data point. Uh, so um, let's, let's take a look at PPFC liability. As we can see, the e liability is broken down into complete different uh, categories or lines here versus scope one, two, three, uh, category one, two, three. So the, in the ideal case, every line of this is really from different supplier specific actual data point. And um, I wanna highlight here is that in this waterfall chart, which visualizes the data point you saw just now, this this uh, this red box, uh, which is pointed to by this uh, triangle, is to purchase the electricity. So from e liability lens, it's really hard to convince ourselves that this purchased electricity out of all the categories here should be the singular focus of the company in terms of decarbonization in the past several years. What are some insights this whole e liability analysis is? providing us. Firstly, it identifies the primary focus areas for uh, decarbonization. So in the case of Pirelli, it's carbon black, it's synthetic rubber, it's steel, it's purchased electricity and heat, as you can see from the waterfall chart here. So it's not really focusing on a specific category of emissions like scope two, but really focus on the important sectors. Secondly, it leads to multiple strategies for reducing emissions. So because the emissions reported are based on secondary data point in the GHG protocol. Some really important and meaningful impactful strategies are completely 
not appreciate it under that framework. For example, changing a supplier, product innovation, improve your manufacturing processes. All these are not appreciated by that framework, but are accounted for in e-liability. So in the case of Pirelli, maybe change supplier A to supplier B can make really meaningful impact on its uh, uh, emission data points. Thirdly, it presents a genuine emission data and traceable uh, emission change. Uh, as I think Alicia talked about, uh, these data points are real data. Uh, when you see the data uh, coming down, it's, 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 it's coming down. It's re really the real actual emission data point of the company. And finally, it incentivizes maximum re reduction instead of following a predefined scope or pace. So we're not saying that Pareto is fine by reducing 1.3% in its scope three purchase goods, but we're saying that Pirelli should really achieve the maximum reduction of its emissions in its supply chain as much as it can go in order to be really com competitive in, 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 the, in, the, in the sector and be the leader of the, of, of the global uh, automotive supply chain. So is this framework practical? I want to use the last several minutes to talk about that. Um, first of all, um, it is more practical in delivering a true and fair accounting of carbon than the GHG protocol, because we're really focusing on the real actual upstream uh, scope three emissions. And in reality, given the close collaboration of the uh, automakers or the key suppliers with their tier one suppliers, uh, this whole data flow might be already well established. For example, in the case of Ford and Toyota, this is a mandatory process of data re reporting for their tier one suppliers. And secondly, uh, the number of tier one suppliers might be much uh, smaller than we thought about. In the case of Pirelli, raw material suppliers only account for 2% of its all suppliers in all parts. So only 2% of suppliers already covers, as we talked about, seven, over 70% of its global emissions um, if we exclude the use phase. And Tesla has already implemented practices to collect actual GHG um, uh, data point from suppliers as, as really the leader in trying to deliver a true GHG uh, data to the public. And also there's new regulations coming up as we speak. Uh, I think it's widely well reported that the recent uh, European battery regulation requires company to really report the whole um, um, manufacturing process as well as the uh, GHG emission data point for the batteries that's manufactured. The goal is that uh, the carbon footprint declaration or the uh, carbon passport of the battery is specific to a battery model produced in a defined production site and sampling of data from different plants are not allowed. And secondly, if there's a change in the bill of materials or energy mix used for the production, this carbon footprint should be recalculated. So with regulations regulating the uh, key, key supplies like batteries becoming mandatory for companies to really operate in the industry, it's really important that Today we have the battery passport. Tomorrow we have a passport of every car, of every component. Uh, so that's really al already the concept of e-liability in, in, in practice. Uh, on the other hand, the carbon assets uh, is another issue in the industry. It's not disclosed in the same rigor as emissions. These spannings, which should actually lead to asset recognition, are usually classified under administrative marketing, uh, donating, et cetera. We don't really know how much a company is spending. We don't know where it sits in the balance sheet or uh, p &L, and we don't really know the details of the carbon credits that are purchased. So this is another study that Mark has done a lot of research and you can refer to his papers for the details of the e-asset ledger, as well as the several criteria of how to recognize e-assets. It's really make the whole uh, accounting of emissions more complete that you have the e-asset, you have the e-liability. Then there, from, from there, you understand the carbon solvency of the company. So the carbon offsets is critical for the automotive industry that you know, according to the database of Carbon Brief, 
28% uh, of the carbon um, credits, carbon offset credits used globally in its database are from automotive companies. And Volkswagen alone used 9.6 million tons of CO2 uh, equivalent of carbon credits. However, only 3% of that total credits purchased by Volkswagen are pure carbon removal projects. So to account for that projects and also setting criteria of which and how to recognize these as assets are really critical as the sector uh, employs more and more carbon offsetting. So final page, uh, final, final section, a call to um, action, we think there are really multiple stakeholders in the automotive industry as well as in the uh, carbon reporting, carbon accounting process. From an investor's perspective, uh, I was an investor before, I felt the focus was really trying to get the data uh, out there and trying to calculate the emissions. So we, this in the longer term should definitely not be the focus of investors. The focus should be the carbon solvency to really understand the unfunded e-liabilities of your portfolio companies. And secondly, for executives, your capital allocation should be guided by frameworks that gives you signals of capital costs, uh, should give you ideas of maximal um, Re reduction of carbon emission instead of a framework that sets a certain predefined category and pace for you to follow. And thirdly, consumers, uh, as we discussed, really need that passport of the products to understand the actual real emissions of, of a car, of a tire to make purchase decisions. And regulators, I think Alicia really talked about this in details and um, really insightful. Uh, discussion in terms of the evolution of carbon accounting, which is much needed. Uh, however, we're not there yet. So, the e liability and the ELM is a evolu it's it's a evolutionary, not a revolutionary framework that we feel brings more insights uh, and and makes the whole process uh, true, fair, and more uh, traceable, auditable, and makes us more confident that we're really on track to the decarbonization not only of the automotive sector, but also of the, of, of, of the global industries. So finally, I wish to thank Alicia and Mark for their extensive supervision and invaluable guidance throughout this research study. Um, thank you. And um, I'm, 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 I'm here for questions. Wonderful. Thank you, XJ. That was fantastic. So much information and, and right on time to allow a good bit of dialogue here with our with our group. I want to uh, invite questions from the audience, and if no one is jumping in right off the bat, I might invite Mark to just chime in to see if he wanted to either ask a question or offer any other color commentary beyond uh, what XJ has walked us through. I guess I want to, you know, uh, Alicia and I were just exchanging some messages here. Um, because well, as she notes, I come up with all kinds of weird cases about that help identify what's wrong with greenhouse gas protocol accounting. And the one that I admit had never come up before, and XJ, maybe you have a lovely answer for it, but one of the, um, to, to highlight how confusing it is to think about a tire manufacturer and downstream emissions is thinking about spare tires. Why, how on earth, if we're thinking about Pirelli's downstream emissions from use phase of a car, how do we account for the idea that there are spare tires? And, you know, you could say that's kind of, you know, it, it, you, you have to think about on the, in the grand scheme of things, that from an OEM perspective, if roughly speaking, 20% of the tires that they put on cars are spare tires, how do we actually keep track of the idea that we have to reallocate downstream um, based on whether or not a car has a spare tire, whether or not that spare tire ever gets used? So there are lots and lots of funny problems in dealing with um, allocating and even estimating downstream or you know just to to take you back to as xj mentioned ferrari has this calculation that they use that reflects 
you know, their best guess at their downstream um, use phase, where in essence, I, if my, recolle my recollection is that they assume their cars are barely driven and they last forever which is not a, a crazy assumption, maybe for Ferrari, but, you know, what do we, what is, what do we know or how does um, a tire company have any idea what, um, what cars their tires get put on or, you know, do they announce that their tires can only be put on EVs, for example? Now, they sell tires that are of standard sizes, you know, widths and whatever the, I can never remember the details of the measurements of tires, but it's like they just announced you can only put these cars on EVs and therefore they declare that they have very low downstream emissions. Um, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to try to hold companies responsible for something entirely outside of their control. Um, but I see there's a question from someone else, so I'm going to shut up. Yeah. Hi, Alicia and, and everybody. It's great to see you. Um, so I'm going to focus my question. XJ, your your presentation was great, and I really appreciate So I've been following e-liability for a little over a year now um, and seeing the kind of position papers that are put out from time to time um, and how clear your thinking is. Um, it's a very, very interesting area, so I love studying it. Um, my question I'd like to focus around kind of Alicia, your opening remarks where you mentioned kind of the, the troubles around SPTI and some, um, sentiment of, of there being kind of, I don't want to say cherry picking, but something around there in terms of, you know, the, the, the logic not being, uh, you know, universally applied, um, you know, the way I understand SBTI is, is sort of the, the referee or the hard rule setter of the GHG protocol because the GHG protocol is a flexible framework, right? SBTI has become that standard of, well, here are the rules. With e-liability, you know, my understanding is that its positioning is both as a um, cut and dry ex post accounting paradigm as well as an enforcement mechanism. So it's, you know, a version of GHG protocol potentially plus SBTI baked in with this idea of there being a carbon ledger where you need to net out, right, your liabilities and your and your assets or your removals. The question I had, and this came from an essay you wrote um, about a, two years ago, right, about how e-liability doesn't necessarily require or entail a Pagovian tax on carbon, that there are uh, ways for market discovery of the true cost of carbon there. I have not seen any proposal on the table for how to actually create a price signal around this. And I'm wondering if that's in development, if there's like some thinking around that, that's what I'm, is, is really how do you create the, the price signal to, to bring these two pieces of information together? Yeah. Wow. Wonderful question. I always love people, love people who engage with our work. So, <laughs> um, yeah, and, no, I love it. It's, so it's thoughtfully yeah. and, and asking such great questions. So a couple of things that are important to point out. There are two big ideas here, right? That that need to be un understood they together, but also separately. So e liabilities is just about the accounting methodology. It doesn't say anything about accountability. So in right. your so e liability and just through the accounting, um, the practice of of doing true and fair accounting of emissions as they move through, you know, cradle to great excuse me, cradle to gate and counting everything only once, that creates the flow of information that enables already competition for lower carbon, lower greenhouse gas emission supply. So the yeah. companies that have been piloting e-liabilities are discovering emission, embodied emissions in their supply chains that then they write into their supplier contracts of like, here's the number you need to beat. So mm -hmm. before you even get into accountability, you can have just the accounting piece do a lot toward in service of decarbonization. But what you're raising is this question of, you know, of, of pricing and ledgers. That's the ELM work. So emissions liability management, which is kind of the accountability okay. uh, conversation, yeah. which is separate. I mean, you, you can have yeah. accounting. It's necessary, but not sufficient, right? You can just yeah. do that. Okay. Okay. So, that's cool. Yeah. So, and it's confusing because they're big ideas and then they're, they're actually two and you got to kind of understand where one ends, ends and the other begins or how they intersect and relate. In the context of the Pagovian tasks and the price signal for 
emissions in the context of a carbon balance sheet, and I'm going to say this, although I'm looking at Mark because it's, it's really his brainchild, is that the cost is uh, of the asset is the is the price to undo the harm. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. It's a market mechanism that that accounts for the technology innovation, the policy innovation, you know, whatever is sort of driving the the forward curve on um, on removals mm-hmm. and on the cost to decarbonize supply chain. So you have a reference asset essentially based on the duration of your solvency. So you could say if you're yeah. looking at it from a purely scientific perspective, you'd say this is a thousand year duration because that's how long the gases persist. Practically speaking, it's hard to imagine anyone starting with a thousand year duration. Maybe they start with 50, maybe they're at a hundred. If you're really generous, you could say some leading companies are doing a one year duration today. They're getting a let, you know, an inventory yeah. and they're doing it, but the inventories are wrong and the assets are wrong, but you get the idea. So it's not that much of a departure from current practice to think about a 50 year duration, you then have to manage a pool of, of removal assets that have a 50 year duration. You might be looking at a price of 30 bucks a ton, 50 bucks a ton. Cause you've got a lot of nature. Um, you then can, that then creates the, 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 the decision-making framework to say, okay, well, if that, I'm going to have to pay 50 bucks a ton for every ton of emissions I put in the atmosphere, I'm going to spend 49 bucks a ton to not have that liability in the first place. And there you get your supply chain decarbonization, you get all your avoided emissions that are now being traded in carbon markets. But instead of trading certificates, you have a, you have capitalized that investment in the form of a lower liability on a balance sheet. So that's how the two, the account yeah. and accountability pieces come together. And that's how yeah. the price gets determined is, is through that reference asset. Mark, do you want to clean up any messages? Me? <laughs> um, I'll just add. So the notion of a Pigouvian tax assumes we know the number mm-hmm. and we don't. Mm-hmm. So if, if we, if we said we know the social cost of carbon and there wasn't wild uncertainty about the social cost of carbon, then maybe we could push the Pigouvian tax up to the level of the social cost of carbon. One complication with that exercise is that mathematically speaking, as soon as you, as soon as you have in your climate damage functions any sort of tipping points, which is a very you know, common discussion of we're going to pass a atmospheric CO2 threshold at which tipping points hit. The problem then is you, as a mathematical exercise and an empirical exercise, you, if you have tipping points, then you cannot actually calculate a social cost of carbon. It's like mathematically, it's not knowable. And so then we're left saying, okay, if all we're ever doing is trying to um, identify a politically tolerable measure of the social cost of carbon, the answer is we're unlikely to get that, that Pigouvian tax high enough. And so what, what ELM does, and, and you asked about you know, what's the pricing mechanism, what we lay out in the ELM paper, in essence says we need a forward curve on the cost of a permanent removal. And so if you think about um, what we need to do as an investment exercise is to make lots and lots of investments in order to drive down the Mm -hmm. long-term price of Mm a a Mm -hmm. permanent removal, because Mm -hmm. it is it is certainly the case that the social cost of carbon is not ever going to exceed the cost Mm -hmm. of removing a ton of carbon from the atmosphere. So we can right now say, okay, look, if a if a if a truly permanent mm-hmm. removal is, you know, f- let's say three to six hundred bucks a ton, then in essence, we know we don't have to worry about a social cost of carbon that exceeds six hundred bucks a ton. If we can get that price down to a hundred bucks a ton, then again we can say, well, we don't care. If the social, you know, the social cost of carbon cannot exceed the cost of a ton of removal because we just remove instead of paying the cost of the social cost. Therefore, yeah. you know, the motivating price yeah. signal of ELM is to say, you know, I don't know how many people, you know, think about this the way um, mathematically, but if you think about um, 
uh, there's a notion of delta epsilon proof, proofs in real analysis where you have something that's converging down and something that must be below the thing that's converging down. So if we say the social cost of carbon can never exceed the cost of removal and we can just push the cost of removals down, then we are definitively solving the social cost of carbon price. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. how we think mm -hmm. about it. And that's why there's so much discussion in mm -hmm. the ELM paper about this notion of bringing down the cost of a truly permanent removal. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe, maybe that confused people more. I'm sorry. Well, we'll see. Are, are, there, are there other questions from the audience? But I was just curious about the, the scope three emissions of, um, of the usage of tires and just how ways to think about that maybe better recalculating that as you know had you explored relationships with other tire manufacturers that maybe have relationships with uh, you know ev fleets that are you're better able to kind of calculate the distance traveled um in order to get a better understanding of like what exactly that scope three number might be actually yeah thanks yeah. thanks for the question tom uh just want to make sure I got your question uh, correct. Sure. You're 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 talking about how we can better estimate uh, for the tire companies the the mm -hmm. the usage of their tire, right? Yeah. Therefore, to to gauge the um, scope three downstream emissions, is that mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, currently, I believe in practice, there's very limited effort in them to really have you know partnerships with the downstream uh Got as it. you said fleet companies or oem customers to understand the usage of their tires uh yeah. out of the five uh parameters that's used by this scope street downstream they actually have two uh three of them so um so they they are they're like according to my research and my conversations with some of them, I believe they're really making in-house assumptions in terms of the uh, 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 powertrain mix of their OEM customers because they're setting to like BMW, uh, Ford, yeah. GM. So they yeah. divide it into OEM, as, uh, OEM customer specific and then maybe get some public information of their OEM customers' powertrain mix, which doesn't necessarily represent the mix of their tires in the OEMs, et cetera, right? And then they have to estimate the geographic grid uh, emissions, right? That if, mm -hmm. if it's EV tires, how these, uh, like the grid emissions are uh, looking like, right? To, 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 to estimate the BAF emissions and then, uh, you know, putting all these together, like what we're what what I'm trying to say that the uh, one single tire company has almost has to estimate the overall OEM, like the whole automotive industry's scope three downstream emission first, and then yeah. segregate the part that's related to the rolling resistance, meaning the rolling rolling resistance leads to fuel consumption, mm -hmm. which leads to the emission. So like in that ground and complex exercise, a lot of the things are uh, done based on assumptions. Okay, got and, it. No, and I, let, me, let me just add, like it, it's an interesting one that if you think about, I, I, I feel like I have too much obscure knowledge of tires, but if you think about like all that really matters in some sense for these estimates is how long is the OE is is the tire manufacturer willing to warranty the tire for because that's way more important than how much the car like the 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 tire the the estimate of the tire of the of the car being driven mm -hmm. is unlikely to be a better estimate than how long does the tire manufacturer warranty the tire for Right, because if 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 somebody's getting if if there's systematically the tires are lasting substantially longer than the tire manufacturer warranties them for, then probably the tire manufacturer should be warrantying the tires longer. If nothing else, remember operating the warranty business for the tire manufacturer is highly profitable because they get to run an insurance company buried within their company. And they make, they make a lot of money off of that. 
And so the notion of saying, if I'm Pirelli and I'm uh, guaranteeing the performance of my tires for 50,000 miles and they last for 100,000 miles, like that would be um, a bad decision financially speaking, to not just warranty the tires for longer. So this notion that estimating tire usage is more important than um, just looking at how long they warranty the tire, it, it's unlikely you're going to get a material discrepancy. Um, or if there is a material discrepancy between their warranty promises and what they're estimating in their downstream uh, emissions, that would be odd as well. Um, so there, there are like this idea, but I, I think it's, it's just important to remember the idea from our perspective of saying, spend a whole lot of money, time and effort to estimate downstream emissions. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't, it's not particularly relevant. And I think I would argue that as a, um, emissions exercise, I just take the warranty data. I'll just take you know, how long do they warranty that the tires are going to stay on the road? And because um, that's a pretty darn fair estimate of the number. Well, well, yeah, until it becomes a compliance exercise and they're gaming their. Right. But I don't think that, like, I mean, the question is, can you game the warranty? I don't yeah. know that you can game the warranty. So it's like if if we compared Pirelli and Michelin and Michelin was saying, you know, um, we are uh, claiming far lower downstream emissions than would be implied in the warranties on our tires. I think we would all raise a hand and say, hey, what's going on there? Yeah. That's inconsistent. So, so I'm conscious. So we are, we're at time. Those of you who need to go, please do. We are really grateful you joined us and this, there, this is recorded and will be available on the website. I see Marsha has her hand up and we have a, a question in the chat from someone who's ironically driving. Um, so uh, ha we are happy to stick around for those two questions, but again, please, you know, it's not rude if you leave at the appointed time, but please, Marsha, go ahead. Oh, thanks, Alicia. I'll be very quick and it's also very basic, but XJ, I wondered if you go back to that slide where you compare tires for ICEs, hybrids, and uh, EVs, and if there's a difference in your estimations having to do with EVs versus ICE tires versus hybrid cars used in uh, tires used in hybrid cars, both in terms of the manufacture of them and the usage of them. And so that much difference from type of car to type of car. Are you are you talking about this this slide? Yeah, I think so. That's the only one where you had it up and I, I'm not sure it addressed the question or not. Yeah. Oh well thanks thanks um Marsha for the question. So this is the life cycle emissions of uh, mid-size vehicles uh, using uh, Postar's data point uh, analyzed by Kearney. So this is not the tires, uh, but you are right on the point as we discussed with Tom that for a tire, it has to get the car emission first and then segregate the part of emission that's attributable to the tire's ruling resistance. So the difference of ice uh, bath emissions for a same model of BMW matters for Pirelli to get its emissions, but we don't really understand how it's incorporating that, uh, that, that type of difference in its like ground exercise of estimating the whole automotive industry's scope three downstream em emissions. And then to your question of, of, of the uh, tire manufacturing and, and also the, uh, I think some other differences, right? You, you touched on in terms of uh, BAF versus uh, ICE. Uh, so usually the BAF uh, tires have higher torque because the BAFs are heavier. It's, you know, the e-motor is, is, has higher torque. So the resistance are usually higher and the tire usually requires to be more premium to the equivalent ICE tires. That's why the uh, Michelin believes that actually transition towards BAV is a good thing for themselves because they're setting into the more premium segment. Uh, so that's that's kind of some very high level um, um, similarities and differences of BAV and uh, ICE cars. But in the manufacturing process, I would say it's 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 the same tire. <laughs> it's it's just a different grade of tire. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the tires the tires on um, the battery vehicles are 
um, significantly um, heavier, heavier duty. Um, you know, there because you, you're dealing with a, a, a ve like the same vehicle has like twice the weight and a, and a whole lot more torque. So the tires are much like the embodied emissions in the tires are probably materially different. Um, but then if you sort of throw in all of the downstream stuff, the notion that the tires for a battery vehicle um, have much higher embodied emissions, it's probably lost in the details. Um, I mean, I, you know, I recently had to replace tires on my um, reasonably new electric vehicle because one blew and um, it's ugly. They're expensive. They're big, heavy tires. <laughs> there was the, what was the question in the chat? I lost, I thought. Yeah, I'll read it. Um, how do we get the high quality emissions for each section of the waterfall chart, is it just scope one and or scope two for each of those, or is it a full waterfall chart for each? For each, I work with companies with ten thousand plus suppliers trying to wrap my head around this approach. And and Kelly, I will drop the uh, AT Kearney. This this discussion came up on my LinkedIn post about this too. I will drop that report in the chat. Yeah, I believe the question on the waterfall chart is for this one, right? Yeah, this is our guest who's driving. So, <laughs> so hopefully they're not yeah. looking at the chart. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's driving on FSD. So like it's Tesla driving. <laughs> 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 Anyways, right. uh, so to quickly uh, answer the question. So unfortunately we don't have the uh, granular data point behind this. That's why we don't want to say it's the liability of Pirelli, but it's the liability on a PPF because we wish we had those uh, data points. So we don't have them. So the data point coming here, uh, here is unfortunately, first is borrowing from a uh, peer tire company, uh, GT Tire, uh, for its e-liability analysis. And second, from uh, uh, a paper of uh, emission uh, factors. So we're still using industry or different company assumptions behind this uh, behind behind this uh, this 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 waterfall chart. So in the ideal case that a Pirelli adopts the e liability approach, this should be compiled from different suppliers. So each bar like each bar here represents the compilation of different suppliers' data point. And one other uh, very important. Uh, thing I think brought up in the original e-liability paper is that the material additive matters to come up with this number that uh, for the raw materials here for the tire company, as we said, like 70%, over 70% of uh, the uh, life uh, of the supply uh, uh, supply chain emissions come, uh, come from the raw materials and only 2% of its total, for example, I don't know how many, as you said, for example, in your case of 1,000, uh, 10,000 10, uh, suppliers, like only 2% of them are in this critical uh, 2% two, uh, 2 uh, raw, raw, raw material uh, category. So if we can talk to this uh, couple of hundred very critical suppliers and get their real data point were a significant step towards delivering a, a genuine traceable auditable um, carbon emission um, accounts. Yeah. But I, the, the only thing I'd add here is that while um, the idea of tracking direct suppliers is much easier um, than trying to track all of your upstream suppliers. The challenge is that the GHG protocol says you need to estimate upstream all of your upstream suppliers. And so, you know, when you have a company that has a thousand direct suppliers, they probably don't actually have any idea how many tier two suppliers they have. Yet the GHG protocol says you're supposed to estimate the embodied emissions that are, that are coming from your tier two, tier three, all the way back to raw material suppliers, which is truly an infeasible exercise. Under e-liability accounting, you simply need to say to your tier one suppliers, tell me your embodied emissions. And 
if everyone works backwards in this recursive fashion, we can reasonably quickly arrive at accurate eliability accounting. And, and the only thing I'll add to that is there's now that process is increasingly enabled through technology and tokenization, right? So you can imagine a future where GHGs are just another currency in an ERP system where you get, you know, cost of goods sold and your your embodied emissions in that transaction. And then companies add their scope one emissions onto that and pass it down as supply chain or retain it. You know, this then this gets to the accountability question of uh, you know, uh, if there's fiscal penalty for those embodied emissions, they may find a reason, you know, that's price signal to invest. If there's uh, an accountability through an emissions liability management function, there's, you know, price signal there. So it's not necessarily true that companies just pass emissions down a supply chain, but you can imagine from a flow of information and a, and a technology enabled distributed ledger of, of greenhouse gas emissions through supply chains, that's, that's actually easy. Um, and that's already happening to a large extent. Yeah. Uh, we're, yeah. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I want to add to what Alicia and Mark said uh, in terms of uh, in terms of both the technology and how this is already a significant step uh, forward uh, in this daunting task of trying to imagine you're tracing your suppliers. Is that the EU battery regulation, which I, I touched on in the in the in the. Yeah slides that it, it is coming already. It's it's becoming mandatory. You have to have the IT system ready to, to really have all the tier one uh, data point in place. So it's the, the technology is more capable than we thought and the uh, evolution is coming sooner than, than we uh, previously expected that we have to have the real data point to have the battery passport as step one. And step two, maybe we have the whole industry falling following the uh, suites and uh, have the e-liability accounts. And we really cannot thank you enough. You carried this through another day job. <laughs> um, and we just couldn't be more grateful to you for your insight and, and the hard work you put into this case study. And, and thank you all for tuning in. Really appreciate your questions and your engagement here. And our inboxes are, are open um, to further conversation. So please don't hesitate to reach out. And this, as, as XJ said, this work is ongoing. You know, these are, we, we've got a North Star, but there's a lot of work to do between here and there. So appreciate your company on that journey.